All right, so welcome to the April uh, Tap Room Tastings. This is the final one, uh, final program for this season. So hope you guys have enjoyed uh, this series of programs. If you missed any of the previous uh, Tap Room Tastings, they are all up on our YouTube channel and uh, a recording of this program, as well as a link to all the others will be sent to uh, everyone at at the uh, tomorrow, it'll be sent tomorrow. <laughs> uh, and then I hope you will uh, join us in the fall, Mary, and I do plan to be back for uh, a new uh, series of taproom tastings in the fall. So keep a lookout for those uh, and the dates and topics for that. Uh, so uh, I should introduce ourselves. Uh, <laughs> My name is Catherine Prescott. I'm the chief curator here at Keeler Tavern Museum and History Center. And my partner in crime uh, for these programs is Mary Celsus Ottomanelli, uh, historian and all around excellent uh, researcher. So uh, <laughs> uh, before we begin, as always, I would like to read our land acknowledgement statement. Uh, the town of Ridgefield exists on the ancestral homelands of the Ramapo, Muncie Lenape, and Wishkwaiskek people. They were the original stewards on the land, on this land on which Keeler Tavern Museum and History Center stands today. We thank them for their strength and resilience in stewarding this land, and we hope to continue their legacy of protecting this site and its history. Uh, so tonight, Mary and I are going to be talking about cookbooks. Uh, cookbooks are one of the first resources we go to whenever we start uh, researching a new food waste topic. Uh, as we'll discover tonight, cookbooks can tell us a whole lot more than just how to make something. Uh, they can tell us a lot about the culture and the ideas about nutrition and um, food and all sorts of things uh, and also community and, and the people who were using the cookbooks and who had access to the cookbooks uh, as well as who was doing the cooking. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about all of that tonight. Uh, this is another one of those topics that we could probably do three or four programs on. So uh, we might have to revisit. Uh, again in the future. And as always, if you have questions, comments, uh, drop them in the chat as we're going, as we're talking, um, we'll, we'll uh, kind of address them as they come up. And uh, we'd love to have you guys involved in the conversation as well. Uh, so to begin, uh, I thought we could start all the way back at the very earliest of uh, cookbooks and recip written recipes. Um, because there are some very early ones. Uh, I found some uh, references to uh, ancient Egyptian and ancient Akkadian uh, recipes that have been written down um, in Mesopotamia and in China. There's also been evidence of written recipes. Uh, but for the most part, they were like uh, few and far between uh, because for most of human history, uh, cooking was taught orally and it was taught in person, right? It was a master and apprentice or mother to daughter uh, kind of situation. Uh, but once you get into uh, the, the late middle ages, the early Renaissance period, you start, do, you start seeing more and more written recipes. Um, and then, of course, once the printing press shows up, uh, then it's almost like a free for all. Uh, after the Bible, cookbooks were the, the most mass produced uh, type of book uh, in, in those early centuries. So uh, early, it's believed, and this is one of the things I found out in my research is a lot of historians have a lot of different ideas about early cookbooks and why they happened and how they happened. Uh, but the general consensus was that these early written recipes kind of before the formalized cookbook um, and a lot of these ancient written recipes weren't supposed to exist. They weren't meant to be saved, right? They were 
uh, supposed to be memory aids that were went alongside in-person and oral teaching, right? It was something you jotted down the list of ingredients or a couple of key steps. Um, and so they were meant to be ephemeral. You would toss the piece of paper or if it was a wax tablet, right? You'd scrape it off and do it for something else. Um, and so a lot of these ancient recipes that do uh, exist today are almost accidental. Like we have them by accident. Um, but once we get into the 15th, 16th century, then people are starting to actually write down recipes, establish cookbooks uh, for that purpose, uh, for transmitting recipes to other people through writing. Um, and so then we get into this huge, there's an explosion of cookbooks uh, in the, the 1600s is really when it starts to form its own separate genre. Um, but a lot of the early cookbooks and even, even later ones kind of come packaged with moral essays and, um, and things on medicine and science and things like that. So uh, cookbooks kind of develop and they, they spread out and separate themselves out from these uh, different lifestyle manuals almost. And they were, I mean, we've talked about the importance to memory and community and how they weren't just pieces that you would write recipes down on. And we've had this discussion, like you mentioned, of people were putting in days of birth. They were putting in days of deaths of friends of women that they were in the same social circles with. It was this kind of diary almost for a lot of women. It was such an intimate piece, um, kind of how we think of a family Bible of having all of those important dates and family members and family tree and events. These were the same thing and they would be passed down from generation to generation. Or if a daughter was married, a cookbook would be made for her to pass down that family history through cooking. Um, as we know that all of the cooking is there's different demographics, right? Northeast cooking is not the same as Southern cooking and different spices and different amounts and food availability and seasonal availability. So it's interesting. And I think we did a good job of our own research wanting to track down and see those shifts in how recipes change depending on where people went, what five years would do over a difference of 10 years to 15 years to 100 years, because some of the cookbooks that we were looking at had over 40 editions. So we're looking at a cookbook that was mid 18th century through almost ninth, end of 19th century, some of these went into and watching some of the recipes change. So I tried to follow pumpkin pie because I was like, this is a very American concept nobody's going to remove the con like no one's going to remove a pumpkin pie because that was my biggest fear and I complained to Catherine for about 45 minutes a day about who made these changes in these additions where did they come from because certain recipes would be removed certain ones would be added and we didn't know who was making the, de the decisions was there like input from the audience where people writing in with their recipes, because I mean, the original writers, A, were either anonymous and had some pseudo name that they would use, or they would pass away and their cookbook, American Cookery, got handed off to somebody else to be in control of. So it was interesting to kind of watch those paths. Um, I'll show you my pumpkin pie analysis. It is... Here we go. So Amelia Simmons, I figured Art of Cookery, Amelia Simmons. This had, it was like 42 editions total, 42, 45, something like that. So 19, lot. yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. So there's always going to be at least 15. Uh, so the 1796 original one gave you two recipes for pumpkin pie. Pie was spelled P-Y-E in the other sections. Um, and they're very straightforward. It was, you know, stewed, strained, three pints of cream. You beat the eggs. Um, you just put everything and you bake it for an hour. And the one on the right, 1805, is not as bare bones. It's still very bare. 
Um, but there's a little bit more to it because you were looking at these recipe books and cookbooks in the 18th century, early 19th century, you were expected to come to the table, excuse the pun, uh, with a knowledge of how to know how to do things like strain something, like to peel something, to stew something, to turn on the fire, to know how to manage your kitchen tools already. These were just guidelines to remind you that you needed a couple of eggs. You needed your sugar. You needed your nutmeg. Um, you needed to go to the marketplace to get some ginger or milk or something else like that. So, I mean, it was a difference. It wasn't that big of a difference, but I probably should have added a 21st century pumpkin pie to really bring this completely forward. Because when you look at the pumpkin pie, you look at the pumpkin pie, you look at a pumpkin pudding, which is also different because the amount of sugar that you put in, um, the ingredients stay the same for the most part. It's the amount that starts changing. And then I'm sure if there was a Southern, like the Virginia housewife probably has a different updated pumpkin pie that has maybe a bit of a different spice to meet their different taste buds, depending on mid 18th century, mid 19th century taste buds. So it's interesting to watch those when you're thinking about a cookbook as such an intimate and personal piece of women's history, essentially. Yeah, so we mostly focus on the 18th and early 19th century. Um, so by that point, cookbooks had become associated with like the female, the feminine sphere. Um, but I did find that early cookbooks um, were written by men. They were about male cooks um, if the cooks weren't writing them themselves. That's a whole nother like rabbit hole I went down which was like the writers versus the cooks um and there was a, a really great book that I read um called uh what is it uh called a history of cookbooks uh but it, it was looking at cookbooks from a literary perspective um so that could be like a whole nother topic um but the early cookbooks in the 16th and 17th century were really, they were written by men. They were, the intended audience was for men. Uh, cooking was a profession that was done by men. Uh, and so there is a, a very interesting shift that I found in the early 18th century where you do get the shift from the male sphere into the female sphere. Um, and so from the, um, the 18th century, you get this overlap where you have a lot of men still publishing cookbooks, but you get more and more women publishing cookbooks. And what they're doing is very different. Um, so male cooks, um, and here's just kind of some uh, male cooks are publishing for uh, these professional chefs and uh, they're kind of, this is out of a tradition of most of the chef cookbook writers had been in royal and noble houses. And so the men's cookbooks in the 18th and early 19th century are like these very fantastical, here's how to put on a banquet for 150 people um, at the Royal Palace of whatever. Um, and so you can see on the uh, left, this is a page out of uh, Le Patissier Royal Parisienne, the, the Royal Parisian pa pastry uh, chef. Um, and it has all of these drawings and they actually fold out. That's why it looks cut off. Um, but this is diagrams for making foie gras pâtés um, for your, your fancy banquet. Um, so you have like fish foie gras and, uh, and the snake. I really love the snake. He looks very friendly. It's perfect. <laughs> um, Whereas the, the women are coming at it from the domestic side, right? The, the men were the professionals. They were the ones who were cooking in uh, the royal houses. But the women are the ones who are cooking just in the everyday house. And so women authored cookbooks tend to be geared towards 
uh, more of that teaching aspect um, we get of cookbooks. And they specifically state they want to be able to teach you know, domestic servants or these kind of the everyday average woman how to cook. Um, and so in the preface to The Art of Cookery, uh, Hannah Glass, the publisher, uh, she writes that uh, I have taken it upon me to instruct them in the best manner I am capable um, and that every servant who can but read will be capable of making a tolerable good cook. Uh, so the purpose of her cookbook uh, which ended up being the best-selling cookbook of the the English language cookbook of the 18th century, uh, was geared specifically towards these women. And you can see a lot of the cookbooks start to include things like how to um, how to go to the market and how to pick different types of fish or fruits or vegetables when they're in season. Um, and Oh, nope. Uh, and uh, you start to see more and more of that uh, directions coming in. So whereas the early cookbooks kind of assume that their readers have a lot of the basic knowledge uh, to do um, things, they don't have a lot of uh, the um, measurements or times, right? They then, whereas as you get later into the 18th century, you start to get uh, measurements and time and you know how long you need to stir something on the stove um, and things like that. So the, the purpose of the cookbooks kind of shifts from this fantasy of being the, the royal chef to actually something that useful person, you know, that would be useful to the everyday woman. Um, yeah, it was interesting because this also led to our discussion of 18th and 19th century cookbooks versus the way that we think about cookbooks today and how we can kind of see that evolution. And I mean, the photography in a modern cookbook or a blog is so much better because I know when I was looking through these cookbooks, I was trying to remember which ones started having illustrations of cuts of meat, of different uh, vegetables and fruits and anything along those lines. And it's few and far between. And it's just the way that it becomes a little bit more accessible of like, well, you should know how to cook versus like, okay, if you don't know how to cook and you're starting out your career as like a servant or you work in a kitchen or this is your own home here are the things that you need to know. And then you look at a common cookbook today where it gives you your entire like backstory of X, Y, and Z before you even get to the recipe. And it's it's been interesting to watch that 200 year shift that we kind of looked at and, and how it's changed. And I kind of like the middle version of the 18th century where it's like very straight in your, like I would love a photo once or twice because I like watching like America's Test Kitchen. I like to know what the final product should look like. So when I try it myself, I know that I've done a decent job. Um, but, you know, a little instruction, a little bit here. I know when we looked at like the 17th and 16th century cookbooks, it was like, you need sugar. Why didn't you know that? And I'm, they scare me. They're very intimidating. So yeah. I like the middle ground. The 18th, mid 18th, 19th century ones are very, good to read and they're not that different from the recipes that we looked at today like the pumpkin pie one is it's all the same basic ingredients yeah I think the the biggest difference between 18th century cookbooks and modern day cookbooks is mostly formatting right yeah it's, it's you know today we list the list of ingredients and then we have step by step whereas in 18th century it's just all in one paragraph mm -hmm. Uh, oh. But for the most part, the, the actual content of the recipes is very similar. Um, but one of the things the very early recipes always reminded me of, um, like from the 17th century, is if you've ever watched like uh, the Great British Baking Show, where they have to do that one, I think it's called the technical, where they get like part of a recipe and they either have only the ingredients or like half of the instructions and half the contestants don't know what the finished product is supposed to look like. Like that's kind of what these 
looking for me, looking at 17th century recipes is like, whereas for the intended audience, they would know what the finished recipe is supposed to look like. Because a lot of them are just like, take this meat and put it in a pastry and close it up and then put these little decorations on it. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, well, how is it like a sand (laughs) crust? Like, am I just covering it? What? Uh, But it's also the fact that a lot of those recipe books were completely ripped from other recipe books. Um, There's full copies of these books just put under different names. So anytime I saw another cookbook that was like 500 new recipes, I was like, they're not new recipes. They're the same ones. It's the same ingredients. And I think they just ordered them differently. So it just became what you could probably get your hands on that was cheapest that you found at like a local bookstore or was handed down to you or was gifted to you. Um, but the only thing that really differed in a lot of these was the way that it was organized. I know me and Catherine were very happy and we would share the the cookbooks that had uh, tables and indexes versus the ones that were just haphazardly put together because I graciously explained earlier, I was completely hunched over on my computer, just like scrolling like this to the point where my neck hurt because I was looking at tiny font and trying to find the thing. And it's not the same experience. I'm sure if I had an actual cookbook in front of me and I turning the pages, it would be a little bit nicer, but you know, we can't get there. Uh, Yvonne asked a question. It's actually interesting. Did female cooks emerge with the growing middle class during the industrial revolution, diminishing the royal households employing men? Um, I do think there was some of that, right? Your, uh, the, the size of staff, even in royal households was being diminished. Um, but mostly it is just a growing middle class. Um, uh, one of the things I did, uh, look into also is with these printed cookbooks, these commercially available cookbooks, um, was about marketing, right? Like Hannah Glass very specifically put her cookbooks in like china shops and toy stores where people with uh, kind of disposable income would go to spend their money and so she's putting her cookbooks in in front of these type of people who um who might now be able to buy a cookbook um who might have the income to buy some more ingredients um you know and there's and it this rise of female authored cookbooks happens at the same time as you do get a lot more social mobility, um, and so you have people entering the middle class and entering the the upper class uh, who want to know how to live their life so that it looks like their new status, and so they use these cookbooks as ways to like this is how to keep up with the Joneses, right? This is the type of table you should be offering your guests. Um, I think Mary has a a picture of the table settings. Oh my goodness. Uh, The role of cookbooks, uh, marketing, and all of that was really interesting. And I don't think either of us expected that connection so much. Um, And the rise of the dining room was a thing that I did not realize was happening all at the same time. So this is just the second course. And it's like um, the fagua that Catherine showed. This is another flip in. So I found this fully from Wikipedia because it was the only high quality one that I could find that wasn't from like a scan. Um, So this is from the experienced English housekeeper. Um, So this is, I didn't write down the date but it's within the last like 1750s to 1850s because that's what I tried to. So you'll just have to bear with me. Um, But the whole dining room experience, um, I saw a description. It was so perfect. It was called a color coordinated space for the exhibition of refinement and gentility in which one was to partake of meals with one's social equals. Um, And it was so interesting to learn about the role that cookbooks played because these cross like inlets would be placed in cookbooks as well. So you would make the recipes that were marked in here and they had to be in very specific places. There was one thing where it was, if you put, if you made an entire animal and it still had the face on it, the face had to, you had to be eye to eye with that animal. Um, 
and everything had to be perfect and the sauces had to be like the perfect experience for everybody, regardless of where you were sitting at the table. And it was a whole, I'm going to say experience again, because they wanted all of your senses to be the same, regardless of where you were sitting on the table. Like this is a whole science. Um, so just to see all of these dishes together. So you're selling your recipes, you're selling the dishes that you would have to go to the specialty store for, which means that you're selling other cookbooks because you're going into those stores. You're selling all of those new utensils and you get this whole new market for saucepans and gravy bowls and flatware. And at the same time in the 1770s, wine glasses start to get reinvented because people want to like sell more wine glasses. So they're like, look at this stem, look at the glass that we're using here. We're moving away from pewter and other metals. And just this performance was just such an elaborate way to eat. And if you did this properly, you were checking off the boxes to move up in social status to be able to say, well, my cook used this, this cookbook and they were able to make all of these dishes so I can be one of you to keep up with the Joneses, which is such a perfect, like, perfect idea of what was going on. And this was just the second course. The second course usually consisted of vegetables, meats, fish, um, exotic pies, um, cheese wigs, um, and a bunch of other things. And then you would have maybe two or three courses and then a dessert course. So, I mean, I made the joke to Catherine, I was showing her this, like they didn't have dishwashers. So you're using all of these pots and pans in your kitchen. You're using all of these plates multiple times and you're feeding probably you want a good dinner party. That's like 10 to 12 people realistically. And it's just like, I really kind of want to look at TV dinners and how we've switched. Um, Cause I, I mean, like, this is, this is so much. And how I also found out my last point is how important the dish plate, the dish placement was because you couldn't just put two things together like that because then they were thinking, it probably requires it's another lecture. It's yeah. just, it's so detailed. Yeah, I think that was one of the things that was very striking about this shift into the, the later half of the 18th century is how much detail there becomes. Mm -hmm. um, I did, I was looking at um, another cookbook. I think it was Maria Rundell's um, A New System of Domestic Cookery. Uh, mm -hmm. which was published around the, the 1800s. Um, and she is another one that starts to have illustrations in her cookbooks, like one of the first female authors to include illustrations. Um, and she's showing like the different cuts of meat, like where, so rather than showing like fancy foie gras snakes statues, she's showing something kind of as a teaching tool, right? This mm -hmm. is where the, the chuck comes from. And this is where um, the different parts, you know, where on the animal it comes from, um, which is something that I don't know. So I was sitting there, I'm like, oh, that's, that's where that's from. Um, it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So and then there's a lot of information in those cookbooks. Um, but I think one of the things that, uh, was stressed in a lot of the readings I did too, was that these cookbooks, while they're meant to be teaching tools, they're supposed to be accessible to this growing middle class. They are not always representative of the reality of what's happening in the kitchen, right? And there's actually a whole other set of cookbooks uh, that maybe can help us kind of bridge that gap of, you know, the fantasy of the published cookbook uh, versus what's happening in the kitchen. And that would be the manuscript cookbooks. Um, so these are the, the cookbooks that are compiled by an individual person um, or generations, right? Of, you know, recipes they get from friends that get passed down. Um, there was this whole culture of kind of upper class women exchanging recipes. Like that was what you were supposed to do when you went visiting, 
would be like exchange, exchange recipes uh, with each other and kind of build this, this manuscript cookbook that you can, could then pass to your, down to your daughter. Um, but I was reading, there's this uh, great blog post. Uh, so there's um, a website that has compiled American manuscript cookbooks uh, and they've made a database of where you can find in what all the different museums, uh, different manuscript cookbooks. And there's a great article about like what manuscript cookbooks can tell us that printed published cookbooks can't. Uh, but at the same time, there's also an element of fantasy to the manuscript cookbook, right? I, a lot of people today, we still collect recipes, right? That we see on, um, you know, on PBS, on America's Test Kitchen or whatever, that we never end up cooking, right? Uh, and, and so that happens a lot in these manuscript cookbooks. Uh, where you get a whole bunch of recipes that are supposed to be like, these are the ones that women are actually using or they're having their cooks use, right? But they found that comparing these cookbooks, mostly what they found in the manuscripts are like these really complicated cakes or sweets or things that is gonna be, they're not done very often and they're more complex than what you would have for like everyday dinner. Because for everyday dinner, if your cook didn't already know the recipe or you didn't already know the recipe, um, you would just go to the cookbook, the published cookbook, um, because every published cookbook is going to have at least one doable recipe for like a roast beef um, or whatever. Uh, whereas the, you know, the spice cake that you're gonna serve to guests at tea is gonna be special and it has to be done exactly the right way. Um, and so that's kind of the recipe you, you write down in your, your notebook to pass down. Um, so yeah. I thought that was really interesting how this one tool that was supposed to like bridge that gap, uh, turns out that it's like creating all sorts of other problems in <laughs> helping us discover what it it really is a way to look at early women's history in a different way. And I know a lot of historians are now taking a second glance at cookbooks and now taking them seriously, which is great because that means that there's more that's going to be added to collections, to archives and to museums and analyzed because you can see that there's, you know, American cookery comes out and it's the first American cookbook because all of these women and all of these, these people using the cookbooks previously were following English recipes and trying to use American ingredients. And then we get American cookery and it evolves and all of those like 40 editions start adding things that are happening in the country. You get president's cake, you get independence cake, you get all of these like very patriotic cake recipes, um, which are all kind of like the same variation of like a pound cake essentially. And they all have the same kind of name. Um, all delicious, not gonna hate on a pound cake because classic. Um, but it's nice to see, you can see an increase of like molasses, like we did on the last lecture of how important that was to everyday life of things that you were doing, of cakes, of sugars, of not sugars, of cakes, of pastries, of regular meals. And then it's showing you, there's a lot of the late 18th, early 19th century ones start adding bill of fares in there of uh, each month, and I can show you some some examples of what was in season or what you should be making at certain points. I think it is. Okay. No, nope. hold on. There. Aha. In April, I found in the experienced English housekeeper what was in season for meat and poultry and roots and fruit and. We've done apples. We've talked about these concepts. We've talked about what was in season, what you could get, what was likely available at the local marketplaces um, and what was probably cheaper and in season. And a lot of this hasn't really changed. Um, although I don't really know if you buy apples in April. I guess apples are still, you can store them so they're still good in April. Yeah, you can preserve them and stuff. I mean, like, you know, I had broccoli last night for dinner. I had spinach. I love celery, but you know, 
it's not too far off from this concept. And I think when, especially when you talk to, to young children or, or people who were like, the diet back then was so different and it really wasn't, it was just about how you prepared it and how you learned to put things together, um, which is really interesting um, because you can see that in different ways. So the cookbook, like the dining set becomes a part of how people started to cook. And that kind that concept of food ways takes over. Um, one of my favorite examples, and I should pull this back up. I don't know why I closed it. Um, was the concept of manuals that would go along with um, cookbooks. So the one from New York City that is most, the one that I put, hey, nope, ah, aha, is the market assistant. So um, I have his, I'll find it. Uh, <laughs> Thomas F. DeVoe was a New York City butcher who spent a really long time going through archives, libraries, newspaper clippings. Um, he went through legal documents to see court cases about why people were arguing with each other, which is such a New York City thing in the first place. Um, and he put together this two volume book. So the first volume is about the marketplaces in New York City. So we're talking from the Dutch to 1867. Um, so that's pretty good because there are a lot of different marketplaces in New York City. Um, there are a few big ones, but it's good to know where all of the tiny ones were. And it, he, and these are very big volumes, so we're talking a couple hundred pages each of how to go to the market. So that's just a concept and it's just a piece of the cookbook. So it's that precursor to you open the cookbook up and you have this recipe. This is how to judge fresh, fresh poultry, which I thought was a great example. Um, because I always see people looking at the meat and they're like, is it good? Is it good? And then people are like trying to get that one cent off because it's all pre-weighed and stuff because nobody goes to a butcher anymore. Um, but how to judge fresh poultry is really interesting and looking at it and teaching people the right way to go about buying the best produce, to buy the best poultry, the meat for their families to cook these recipes. Um, I pulled up pineapples because I thought it was great because it was like their season starts first of April and lasts until September. And that just shows the amount of uh, produce that was coming in from the rest of the world, essentially, and where they were coming from. So they are brought in from Havana, Nassau, Matanazas, et cetera. Um, weight is from two to five pounds. And that's like one of the fruits that's mentioned. There's a few images in this of the cuts of meat and what to look out for and how to prepare it when you get home. And then it's also like, if you have extra or you have the fat, here's how to store it. Here's how to make a solve. Here's how to make soap out of it. Because it truly was, you don't waste anything. You go to the market with your money. You spend your money. You make your recipes, but you also have to use everything to make it really like stretch your dollar, which I think is very, it's such a, it's still such a concept today, right? Like we always want to make sure that our dollar goes very far. Um, I say this with the concept of like price of eggs and everybody freaking out the last couple of weeks and how expensive groceries are because of inflation. So it's the, it's the same concept. So when you think of those things, you want to look through and it's a really good read. It's a very long read, but it's very interesting because it's all the same things, right? Like look, how to buy poultry is the same advice you would give somebody today. It's not that much different. Yeah, and I think uh, we talk about these cookbooks are meant to to teach and, and how the, the changing content of the cookbooks are showing kind of these changes in, in society um, at, at the, the time of the 18th century. The other thing I found in looking through a lot of these cookbooks, specifically we were focusing on English language cookbooks, um, is how you see kind of uh, attitudes towards other cultures, right? Because food is kind of one of those things that travels across borders fairly easily. Everybody loves food, so they all um, exchange recipes and things like that. Um, and so I thought it was really interesting, like looking at 
a bunch of different cookbooks and seeing what certain recipes are called, like when they're attached to a different culture or nationality. Um, and it's really interesting. Like some of them you can tell and, and um, some of them are just, you know, this is what is made in this particular place, right? Like um, in uh, one of the books, they were talking about how like bologna um, is, bologna sausage it's from bologna italy and in italy in bologna it's called sausage it's called mortadella and everywhere else in the world it's mortadella di bologna right mortadella from bologna um because in bologna it doesn't need to be called from bologna um so there's there's some of that and then there becomes this like um kind of certain types of food get attached to very specific cultures. Um, and it was really weird. There's one, um, like there's a bunch of fish recipes that are called like Hungarian fish or Polish fish. And both oh, Hungarian yeah. fish and Polish fish just have onions and apples. Um, and it's, unclear and I tried looking this up why that was specifically Hungarian or Polish um but it was not you know nobody could find out so but uh this one article I was reading suggested that maybe it was just because the people who were making fish that way at that time were Hungarians and Poles in these various other places. And so that, that's how the fish preparation became known as Hungarian fish. Um, but I think the, the culture that had the most influence on European foodways is the French. Um, starting basically in the 1600s, the French kind of just started dominating um, food culture. And mostly that was because French cooks were ending up in all of the different royal uh, kitchens and and then they would filter down into the noble kitchens and then slowly that those food would kind of uh, filter down into the rest of the population um, but when you're looking at the English cookbooks throughout time it's very interesting to see how their attitudes towards French cooking change based on whether or not they're at war with France um, because it's very, I mean, the English and the French, they have like this very hot and cold relationship, right? Uh, they're either, you know, good friends or they're, you know, trying to take each other's heads off. Um, and so it trickles into a cookbook. <laughs> it does. Uh, because I was looking right at the, the very end of the 16, the 1600s into the early 1700s, uh, French culture was very popular in England. Uh, this is right at the Stuart Restoration. King Charles II uh, had spent his exile in France. So like French cooking was very popular. But then in the 18th century, there's the, um, the succession crisis. And all of a sudden, everything Catholic is a no-no. And that includes French people and French cooking. Um, and so it becomes very unpatriotic to uh, have a French chef or to enjoy French cooking. And what comes under the heading of French cooking basically is anything complicated or uh, flavorful, essentially. Full uh, of sauces. Full there's this whole category of dishes called ragouts, which are basically just like very um, creamy and spiced uh, sauces. Delicious. And all of a sudden, they're like, that's not what you're supposed to be eating. And as I was reading this, I was thinking, you know, there is this stereotype of traditional English food being like not flavorful, right? There's that joke that the English conquered the world for spices and then never used any of it. Um, but if you look at the early recipe books, they're using spices left and right. And then you get to the 18th century and all of a sudden spices and herbs equals French equals no. Um, mm -hmm. and so now you're down to your boiled meats and 
you know, oh. flour puddings and biscuits and things like that. Um, but one of the things I thought was um, really interesting and I loved was you can see it in. Uh, oh. <laughs> in the cookbooks, right? So The Complete Housewife by Eliza Smith in 1730, she writes in her introduction, these receipts are all suitable to English constitutions and English palates, right? They're wholesome, toothsome, and uh, all practicable and easy to be performed. Uh, so she's focusing, this is for English people. And then in Hannah Glass's The Art of Cookery, she talks about in her, her preface uh, that, you know, French, the way the French cook, it's really expensive. You can do this French sauce um, and it'll cost you like the same it would cost for an entire meal of English food. Um, but I love, she has this one line, if gentlemen will have French cooks, they must pay for French trickery. Um, and then she also has this other, quote, so much is the blind folly of this age that they would rather be imposed on by a French booby than give encouragement to a good English cook. Um, and then it comes back, Hannah Glass was very much against French cooking. Uh, you know, the entirety of chapter three is called, read this chapter and you will find how expensive a French cook's sauce is. Um, and it's dedication. Her first, her first recipe just says she has the, um, the quote, this dish, I do not recommend it. Um, <laughs> she, she included it in her cookbook and then said, don't make this. Uh, but you then see that that, that kind of nationalism in cooking uh, trickles its way down. And then you start to get a lot of regionalism, especially in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and so these are three cookbooks um, from the first half of the 19th century. We have the New England Cookery uh, by Lucy Emerson, which is literally a word for word uh, copy of American Cookery by Amelia Simmons. Uh, literally, there's like no difference between the two. Uh, and then Mary Randolph's The Virginia Housewife, uh, which I think is probably the most popular, like one of the best-selling American cookbooks. Um, and then the Carolina Housewife as well was another popular one. Uh, so you start to see these regionalisms, the regional cookbooks, um, which end up being better sellers than uh, the more general ones like American cookery. Um, Here is a Kentucky one too. I know I, I looked through a few of the Southern ones and again, it was just kind of I was like, well, didn't I look at this one? And you remember that because there's no copyright laws, they're all just copying the same, essentially like four to 500 recipes yeah. over and over again. And they'll change the order of them or the spelling yeah. of them. But I mean, but it's, it's the same. It's really this, those three cookbooks have mostly the exact same recipes in them. Like they, they're regional in that they have different states on them. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of the cooking, there might be a couple of differences uh, in terms of uh, some of the ingredients and uh, some of the, the things like they might leave out certain dishes. Uh, but for the most part, the recipes are very much the same. Um, yeah. But I do think that's the other thing that you can kind of use these cookbooks to see what kind of ingredients are becoming more and more available because mm -hmm. with these published cookbooks, uh, they're not like the cutting edge of culinary science. They're recording and encoding things that have been in the culture for a very long time. Um, and so you're starting to see, it takes a while actually to see changes and in introduction of different um, ingredients and also different tools like kitchen tools um and so i i remember and this is another you know whole episode we could talk about is like the 20th century cookbooks um because even by the mid 20th century a lot of cookbooks even though oven thermometers and oven thermostats have been 
invented and are widely available. A lot of those mid-century cookbooks are still using like slow oven, quick oven, kind of those um, hearth oven uh, terminology. It's, It's hard to have them change, I find, even though I remember seeing, and you can see in the cookbooks, they start shifting um how they're cooking but I mean for the most part a hearth is the main way that people are going to be cooking and that will impact the cookbook the ingredients the instructions and everything like it's not just a cookbook it's about 18 other things that all kind of intersect with each other to make a food ways and the way that we think about how people eat and again it's always just one of those like oh yeah, that totally makes sense now that I have to like think about it and go, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, I wanna make sure I get to it before we we, uh, run out of time, but all of this talk about cookbooks and how much they can tell us about the lives of the people in the 18th century, um, that takes us to the people who are here at Keeler Tavern. Right. Um, so I did try to look in our, our archives um, and I pickings were slim, but I did find uh, two recipes that have been uh, in our archives. Um, and here we go. Uh, so we have one that's Sarah, uh, Cousin Sarah's Cake, uh, which is a basic. Uh, cake. These are both from the 19th century. So we have Cousin Sarah's cake and then a recipe for sponge cake. Uh, these were both found in the journal of Anna Marie Rezeki, who uh, grew up in the house, lived here her entire life. Uh, she was born in 1830 and um, she, she died in, in 1913. Um, so these are from that period. Uh, but this is part of that like manuscript uh, cookbook tradition, right? These short recipes that are on uh, slips of paper that get stuffed into a, a journal. Um, and you can kind of see how they're not full recipes, right? Cousin Sarah's cake just has a list of ingredients with some measurements. And then there's a, uh, a question that says, what shape is a kiss? Um, <laughs> So like, there's no instructions as to how to make the cake. Um, there's a riddle instead. So, um, and we know like, one of the things that Mary and I were talking about is we have a lot of personal papers from both the Keelers and the Rezikis, but we have just these two uh, recipes. And so it was really interesting for us to kind of think about, well, how were the women and the domestic servants in, and slaves in this household, how were they, what were they making and how did they learn these things um, and how are they taught? Uh, because we know during Anna Marie's time, the cooking was mostly done by um, Phyllis Dubois. She's a, a black woman who, who also grew up in this household and lived her uh, life from a very young age here and she was known to be a very good cook um, but we don't really know how she learned who taught her um, any of that stuff and then uh, even before Anna Marie and Phyllis we have uh, Esther Keeler uh, who was helping her husband run a tavern that was supposedly had food for sale uh, and uh, and we know that at, at before uh, Esther got married, she did purchase a an enslaved uh, toddler, and we don't know if that that toddler Betty Isaac uh, was here in the house if she grew up and and fulfilled the role of cook or or who was doing the cooking. Um, the closest we could get to kind of a cookery book at Keeler Tavern is. Um, there was a, a bookseller in New York City named Hugh Gain, uh, who Timothy Keeler did purchase books from. So we have his uh, bill of sale, and, and Timothy purchased six Bibles, 
uh, one copy of the Monitor, whatever that is, and 18 copies of Dilworth, which is a, a school book. Um, I wonder if it's and, a and newspaper. I, and I found uh, a copy of Hugh Gaines. He published in a newspaper an advertisement uh, stating that he's bringing in all of these things from London and included in that inventory is glasses cookery. So we do have a connection to some place that Timothy could have bought a copy of glass, Hannah Glass's cookery book. Um, so maybe Esther had a copy and one of her daughters took it when they left um, to build their own households or what. Um, but yeah, that's one of the things that's interesting I find fascinating about diving into our archives is finding these <laughs> gaps and how we can kind of connect them uh, and Elizabeth did there's no flower specified in cousin Sarah's uh, cake which you're right there isn't uh, one coffee cup of new buttermilk one coffee cup of sugar uh, one teaspoonful of saleratus which is uh basically the precursor to baking soda and one little piece of butter. That's so I, that would make a very Oof. strange cake. I don't know. We should try it one day. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, I mean, we had this whole discussion of what cookbooks Timothy Keeler would have had, where would they have come from? It's just, I mean, piecing together anything that was made at a tavern is always completely impossible. It's not something that will ever come easy. It's just one thing that we want. It's just one simple thing. Um, but it was interesting because we were trying to piece together likely cookbooks that he would have purchased. He would have needed some for his household. He would have needed some for the tavern or, you know, what was going on in Ridgefield. Was there any, I was asking Catherine what Ridgefield looked like at the time. Were there any cook like bookstores? kind of piecing it together that way but I mean you can only kind of assume that he probably I mean probably had that right um before we go I just want to share in the spirit of cookbooks and family cookbooks and memory um and the fact that recipes are very tiny and like not very well written out this is my family's traditional Greek Easter cookie. Um, so this is my grandmother who is pushing 97, still making them herself with the original recipe um, that's been passed down in my family for multiple generations that we all kind of make together around this time. Um, we were making some on Wednesday. Um, so it's a very simple one. The ingredients are very simple. The recipe itself as to how to do it is very simple. It's just eat eggs with yolk and sugar. Um, my aunt, the other about a year or two went and like finded her own little book because we had tiny pieces of paper, like a manuscript kind of spread all over between our papers and my grandmother's papers. Um, but it's just a very simple cookie. It felt appropriate to share it. I wanted to share it. It's a very good cookie. It's a very sweet. Um, it's great to dip in coffee if anybody's interested. Um, but yeah, we make these all year round. So I say Easter, but we have them we make large batches every couple of months. Uh, but it's a very simple, like, it really did remind me of the 18th century, like, here's your ingredients list, here's how you make it, be free and go. And there's definitely room um, to upgrade it, to change it, to swap things out if you want to change the, the taste of it. And of course, because there's always going to be a regional difference in who makes it, depending on what family member I speak to. So everybody's tastes a little different. So everybody gets very competitive around the holidays when we like share the cookies. Um, but I thought I would share because it felt fun to do so. Um, reading everybody else's recipes, I thought I'd add 501 to the comments, of course. Mary, Bruce um, pointed out that you also did not list how much flour is needed in the cookie recipe. <laughs> I did it. It's not in there. Did I not type it? Oh my goodness. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's all right. It's keeping in the spirit of, you know, we've got it. Oh yeah. The mystery of it. We've got to figure it out. Is there not? Yeah. I think you say add the flour, but you didn't put down how much flour. 
it's it's in like a cookbook <laughs> you see you see we've come full circle this evening uh but thank you for pointing that out i wonder if my like actual binded book is wrong now i'm gonna go look after the program well, we, should find out, we should find out and we'll include it in the, the email yeah <laughs> happy to share a family recipe with the group uh yeah they're very if i'm making them they're very easy to bake you just need it you just need like a like a standing mixer that's because doing it by hand is too traditional for me <laughs> all right so we've come to the end if anyone has any last questions uh, feel free to drop them in the chat uh and uh mary and i will be uh we'll send out the recording and uh included with that i will include uh some links to where you can find some old cookbooks uh, in case you're interested in exploring some of these 18th century cookbooks. Uh, through our research, we found a ton of different ones. And the great thing about the 18th century cookbooks, they're all, they were never in copyright. So there's plenty of options uh, for finding them online. Uh, and uh, yeah, so Thank you everyone for joining us for this program and for all the other ones that we've done this year. And I hope you will join us again in the fall. Um, also, we will be sending out a, a, a survey. Uh, if you could, we'd love it if you could fill it out and just let us know uh, your thoughts, but also topics that you're interested in uh, for the future. If there's any particular food item or uh, cuisine that you'd like us to explore, uh, please let us know. And we'd love to kind of see what, what people are interested in. So I hope you all have a wonderful evening uh, and a wonderful uh, summer. And we'll see you again in the fall. Bye, everybody.